Hello, dear. You too. Welcome back to the Failing Writers Bookshop. Now, what are you after today? Right, something a bit convoluted? I see. An odd with slightly awkward dialogue. Uh huh. Hmm. And a disappointing anticlimactic ending? Well, I reckon I've got just the thing for you. Step this way. <laughs> Right, Tom, we've only got a little tiny gap to do the Scrivener ad, so we'll need to be quick. OK, Scrivener is a brilliant way to organise and plan your writing. Yeah, whatever you're writing. Yes! Was that quick enough? Actually, that was possibly a bit too quick. I think we've got a uh, time left. Oh, all oh, right, so I should uh, I should do a song then, right? Um, oh, no, no, I've got my big hand and my little hand all messed up. Uh, we've hardly got any time left. Uh, quick, sum me up, sum me up, John. Do it now! OK, uh, if, if you're a serious writer or a writer of serious things or seriously into writing or not that serious but still writing or write serious about writing seriously, you seriously should think about getting Scrivener. Yes! Get a 30-day free trial at literatureandlatte.com. And you get 20% off at literatureandlatte.com using the code FAILING. Yeah, I don't think you need to say the web address again. That just wasted time, Tom. Right, OK, forget I said literatureandlatte.com and just remember that you can get 20% off using the code FAILING. Much better. <laughs> Great. How are we doing for time, by the way? Oh, I think we'll be fine. Hey, you watch it. It's us again with another teeny weeny in between the episode. Yay. Here we are again. <laughs> just when you thought you had a break from us, we all up in your face again. Yeah, no, sorry. Look, before we... Mm. What is it you're trying to achieve with this little episode, John? You're not sounding very enthusiastic, Tom, already. And we've not we're not even like No no look well I don't I don't want to be a negative Nelly or anything. <laughs> right. I don't know. I just I, I don't understand how the, is this episode interesting, the content of? I d I don't I know it's connected with writing and stuff, I get that, completely get that, but bookshops, like a whole like a full episode, is that not a bit? Well it's quite a short episode. Well, let's so, be thankful for small mercy, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a positive spin, sort of. Yeah, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is mm. just not my, not my kind of thing. Well, I don't really understand it. Okay, well, I understand that. But why don't you just, why don't you let me lead the way, mm. right? And let's see if we can't change your mind as we go. What do you All think? right, okay, mm. okay. I'm, All right. I'm open-minded. There yeah. you go, Tom. Well done, mate. So you might not be aware, but it's bookshop day coming up on the 14th of October, which is the annual celebration of bookshops across the UK and Ireland. Exciting. And I thought for someone like me, bookshops are... Nerdy. You mean nerdy. Like, yeah, I, except I can be a little bit... Of a, a dork. A touch of a dork, perhaps, yes. <laughs> yeah. For someone like me who loves... Can you be a massive dork and a total nerd at the same time? Uh... <laughs> you know, like if there was... If you had like the dork kingdom, mm. we'll call that... Dorkshire. Nice. And they were always fighting yeah. with the land of the nerds, Nerdy Stan. Yeah. You got the picture so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was Dorkshire mm -hmm. and Nerdy Stan. They are going at it all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think then you, yeah. you would be the chosen one that's there to bring balance and would unity I? to the nerds and the dorks. Do you know what I mean? You'd show them that you don't have to take sides. You don't have to ah. fight. You can just be massively both. <laughs> All right, I get I get the picture, Tom. Listen, I am just a normal guy who loves to browse a bookshop. I don't get it if you if you're not that way inclined. That is just how I am. I would genuinely be gutted if bookshops disappeared. Can you imagine how worse off the world would be, Tom? Are you you are you yawning, Tom? <laughs> no, it's just having a <laughs> elongated breath in between. Come on, yeah. cut out with it. What is the problem? What's your just... issue? I just don't get it, I have to say. What? Bookshops was something I would get dragged into when I'm a kid. Oh. And it's just an equivalent. It may as well be a shoe shop or, do you know what I mean? It just doesn't. It's like, meh, You've almost yeah, got like whatever. a sort of PTSD kind of thing going on. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you see, for me, they're just like magic places. You know, this, it's like each one of those books is a world that you could just walk into for me. Imagine that. You're a, like a, a, a portal. Yeah. I just love them. They're just lovely places. You say that, but you would have to actually sit down and read the book, wouldn't you? You would. I mean, ideally, that's sort of how it works, yeah. Yeah. But I just, I love bookshops. I mean, I think they are surviving, but, the, you know, there have been a lot of 
bookshops closing down as well. Yeah, does it does it take something special now for a bookshop to exist? Like, does it need to be particularly good or particularly different or something? I think just so. To... I think a lot of a lot of bookshops are diversifying a bit, aren't they? They they're kind of hosting events and they've got cafes in them. Um, yeah, and being a bit of a destination yeah. in itself rather than just a, some yeah. friends of the family own a, um, a bookshop called Goldfinch down in Alton. Shout out for them. And uh, they do like literary quiz nights and stuff, but they're all very inclusive in the community, you know, and they and they have a cafe and <laughs> you can imagine it. Can't, it's going to be nice. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad for you now that we're going to do this episode. Listen, the good thing is I can do the interview. You don't have to get involved. Yeah. I'll go okay, and, I'll I'll go go and chat to a bookshop, see what I can find out. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Let's do that. <laughs> Well, I was this thinking is the equivalent. This is equivalent of me being a kid getting dragged into a bookshop. And just, <laughs> totally can I just went outside with Dad. <laughs> it totally is. Listen, yeah. this is what. Let me try and describe what I was thinking. Right, is that these are the people who are flogging the things that we write, and I just mm-hmm. thought it might be mm-hmm. quite interesting to get an insight into how booksellers actually think. Yeah. So I popped down to my local independent bookshop, The Grove in Ilkley, for a chat with the manager to see what I could find out about the business of selling books. Shall we, uh, shall we go and see what happened? Yes, let's. <laughs> I am here in my lovely local independent bookshop, The Grove in Ilkley. It's just gone half five and we've closed the doors to the public. And I'm now sitting here with Mike Sansbury, who is the manager. Hello, Mike. Hi. How's, how's it going? going? It's, it's going really well, thanks, John. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Pleased to hear it. So I think writers probably don't spend a great deal of time thinking about how books are consumed, yeah. Yeah. I suspect, anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought it would be really nice to get an insight into the world of books from your perspective. Uh-huh. And, you know, because you're kind of the end of the, you're yes, at the, end yeah, of the yeah. journey, you know, in between the writer's brain and, uh, you know, the, the book <laughs> being in somebody's hand. But yeah, maybe let, let's start with you. How did you end up in the world of book selling? Well, I mean, I spent, probably spent half my life in bookshops anyway, browsing and buying. And I'd been working at the Tate Gallery in Liverpool. Coincidentally, Waterstone had just lost their art buyer. I was there, they needed someone to run the art department, so I went and did it. I see. And soon realised that it was a job that I should have been doing all my life, really. It's just made for me. So I've, I've been in it ever since, in one, one way or another. I worked for publishers for a while. I did a, I worked at a university bookshop and then ended up here about 12 years ago. So who actually, who actually owns the bookshop? Uh, it's owned by Kevin Ramage, who has been a bookshop owner and bookseller for oh, longer than I have, certainly. He used to own a bookshop in London called the Owl Bookshop, which is in All Kentish right. Town. And he also has a place in Scotland, in Aberfeldy, the Watermill. Mm-hmm. And he bought this shop about 20 years ago, partly because he has family in the area. And he moved to Bristol about three years ago to take a step back from the business. Mm-hmm. So we've always run our own stuff here anyway. We choose what we stock. Yeah. Uh, so he moved to Bristol to, to step back and then end, ended up buying two more bookshops while he was down there. Oh, right. He just can't stop. He got the Lime Bookshop in Lime Regis and a new shop called Bookhouse, spelt the German way, and that's quite a radical sort of shop with a political slant, oh, but, right. you know, very modern, but sort of antithesis of this shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. We're cosy there. They're cutting edge. Uh, so, John, mm. what what would you call a bookshop when you, when you own one? I assume you're going to at some point. So <laughs> what are you going to call it? Um, I've got I've got a few thoughts. Yeah. Uh, if I couldn't afford the rental of a big shop, mm. I would just build a large shed on the high street and call it the Novel Hovel, and I'd probably I'd probably <laughs> sell Bovril from the Novel Hovel, especially in the winter months. Yeah. 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 Uh, I thought that'd be quite nice, quite quite cheap. Yeah. Uh, what about you? Yeah. Have you you got any thoughts? Well, I had a an overarching concept um, for a bookshop. Ooh. Um, I thought call it bookie dip and <laughs> you don't get to choose what you basically you just have to put your hand in a massive barrel of books that is good and whatever you pull out you've got to buy that's that's the book you come i like out that that's really good i mean all bookshops should do that anyway shouldn't they i would go in more bookshops if you didn't have to look at all the books yeah and you just pull one out and you have to read it you know i mean if you didn't have to walk around and look at books you see there will be some bookshops listening to this and thinking hey, hey. Oh, we'll, we'll have a bookie dip in the corner hey hey bookie dip yeah <laughs> yeah. Have you got any more? Uh, yeah, I was thinking a shop selling only like super up to the minute 
contemporary fiction uh and you would call it the funk soul brother and in right. writing underneath in brackets it would be right about now <laughs> that's good good yeah. good good i thought it was going to be book to the future but that's good that's good <laughs> another this again i'm i'm all about you know me i'm a, I'm a big ideas guy i'm about the overarching concepts <laughs> very much what so, about yeah. and what about a bookshop mm. and it's called book 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 mm. and it's usp it's unique <laughs> proposition to the marketplace mm. is that book 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 <laughs> is run by chickens I thought you were going to say it's got, yeah, it does like fried chicken on the side. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's actually run by chickens. Right. Okay, so they, they sell you the books. Yeah, they're working do the they, and stuff. Do they yeah. buy in the books as well? Because I feel like there's going to be a little bit of bias towards it's, like bird-related <laughs> literature. Quite possibly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. Uh, to kill a mockingbird. <laughs> wild swans. Yeah, you know, quite, that possibly, kind of stuff. quite possibly. Quite possibly. Um, and I would imagine the cookery section would be a tricky issue in many ways. <laughs> yeah, a lot of plant-based books. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I like it. Um, I'd like to own one uh, right at the top of a tall building with amazing views and call it multi-story. That would be quite nice, wouldn't right. it? Right, yeah. And if I had yeah. an erotica bookshop, I would call it Telltale Tits. That's good, actually, that one. It's quite nice, that, I can isn't it? see that on a sign, yeah. 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 If I had a bookshop, it would be a very super-duper radical political bookshop called Left on the Shelf. I can smell onions. Can you smell onions? Have you got a genuine one, like if you did actually own a bookshop? I've got a serious one. All right, no, no, I absolutely haven't. <laughs> Why would I? <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> What, no, what's she serious for? <laughs> Fair point. Oh, uh, yeah, probably. Who gives a book? I <laughs> oh, just that, yeah, would reflect nice. my yeah, ref yeah. reflect my personal feelings <laughs> about bookshops. Well, I think it should. You know, that's that's the idea. It should reflect your philosophy about books. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But for me, they're like you know because they're like the lights being turned on situations. They they take you on intoxicating rides. They introduce you to new worlds and lives that you'd you know you'd never get to experience otherwise. So you're going to call it John's bookshop? No. Right. I'm going to call it Let's Get Lit. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, levels. Levels. That's like, that's very good, that, actually. Isn't it? That is very good. So, yeah, that's that's mine. Let's Get Lit. So, hey, should we go back to the bookshop now and hear about the current climate for bookshops? How about that, Tom? I was just going to ask you about the current climate <laughs> for bookshops. I thought you were. So let's I find was. out. Yeah. I want to get on to how the bookselling business has changed. Obviously, they've, they've been fairly seismic shifts yeah how, how is it sort of generally at the moment from your point of view generally it, it's pretty good uh, i mean in the current economic climate everyone is struggling so i wouldn't say we're, we're in the middle of a boom but we are riding the crest of a, a really successful wave that started ironically with lockdown once we were closed we had to find a way of reaching our customers and keeping the business going so we've got the website running so we could sell stuff online we hand delivered to people. We let people come and collect stuff at the door. So in a way, not being able to sell directly for a while kind of helped you set up the infrastructure to more easily sell yeah, online. And definitely. Bookshop.org, which you'll know about. They see themselves as kind of the independent bookshop version of Amazon. So hmm. they sell books centrally. And any sales that go through our part of their website we get a substantial amount of credit for. So, right. so we, and we don't really have to do anything for it. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's yeah, it all like happens in the network. background. Yeah. I mean, some shops are worried, maybe shops that relied a lot on their internet sales were worried that bookshop.org would take sales away from that because they're offering a, dis a slight <laughs> discount. Mm. And obviously the shop isn't getting the full amount for the books. But um, I think for us, it works really well. During lockdown, it was a godsend. Yeah, yeah. We were doing really, really well out of it. And now it's just there in the background and every month we get a certain number of sales through and it just adds to, adds to our taking. So yeah, yeah. I started using hive.co.uk who were kind of advertising the fact that they give a percentage of yeah. their, whatever their profit is to uh, a bookshop that you designate, I think, from memory. It's been a while since yeah. I've used them. 
But then I found out that the amount that they give is really <laughs> minuscule. I mean, at the time, it, it was just something, you know. So yeah, yeah. Better than uh, nothing. I think Bookshop.org <clears throat> is sort of the revved up version of, of Hive, really. Right. That's good to know. Good to know. What are the best things about running a bookshop? Um, well... <laughs> got, obviously, yeah, you have access to a lot of books. Yeah, it's quite it's, nice. it's seeing books all the time, seeing new books before they come out, being able to choose whatever I want to put on the shelves, along with my colleagues. You mm. know, so if I, if I think something's worth a go, I'll, I can order it, put it on. No one's going to say, no, I'm sorry, that's not shop policy. Mm. You can't do that. Um, do you, just out of interest, do you kind of develop a sixth sense about, because you, you've been, how long have you been here? I've been here 13 years. Have you got a kind of sense of what is going to sell? Yeah, I've I've been, having been here that long, I, I've got to know the customers very well. Um, so quite often I'll order stuff thinking, well, I know who'll who'll like that, right. or or just the kind of thing that our customers like as well. Mm. We have uh, a thing we're doing at the moment where any author who comes to visit, we'll ask them to give us a list of their either ten favourite books that okay. affected them or changed their lives or whatever. And then we put a display up. And the most recent one we did was Matson Taylor, who wrote a book called. The Misadventures of Evie Epworth. And he's a, he's a curator at the V&A and writes in his spare time. Mm -hmm. And he's from Yorkshire as well. So it all, it's all kind of fitted in. And the books he listed, they were just so on the nose for our customers. And right. It was, it was amazing. So we did a display and obviously they, they, they sold really well. So you, you haven't like slipped him a list? No, not at all. No, I just looked at the list up by me. That, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> that's fine. Sometimes you think, well, I might not order that one. And I just change that. But no, spot on. Is there a time you get it horribly wrong and you order a lot of a book? Yeah, yeah, just, it happens all the time. Doesn't... I mean, it, that's the thing. But the thing with books, it's sale or return generally. Right. Okay. So we, we've got six months to a year to see how they go. And if we don't sell, as long as they're in good condition, we can send them. Right, so you're books. very rarely left with a, yeah, a whole yeah. load of stock. That's good. We, we do the Oakley Literature Festival once a year, and that is a bit of a guessing game with quantities of books. You know, you, you know which books you've got to get, but... You can be stung with returns then sometimes because you order, you know, 50 copies for an event and you sell five mm. and then yeah, you can yeah. only send so many back. But generally, the way the industry worked is geared towards taking a chance on things because mm. you, you've usually got a way out. Yeah. Mm. So, Tom, you're, you're a writer, right? And you have to come mm. up with a list of the top 10 books that changed your life, right? You've been asked to do that by a bookshop. What are the right. top two on that list. Two. <laughs> you can have one if you want. Can I just pick one? You can pick one. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you remember the Red Tractor series from primary school. Oh God, do I? Yeah. But there was one where oh. the Red Tractor got stuck in a field. Mm. And I've always felt that was a very No. Um seriously, there is actually a book which putting together this episode has made me think I need to go back and reread. Oh. Which is again well, it must an have been heard of thing for you to be thinking that. Uh, of course, it's not a fiction book. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, a real book <laughs> um, called Factfulness. Ah, yeah, and it is a fascinating that is book. Good. And fantastic, and it really does change how you think mm. and view the world about the information you're being fed. Mm. So it is literally a daily basis life changer mm. because as soon as you're getting news or you're seeing stuff on social media or yeah. claims for this and, and you that. you take so much stuff as read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way it just breaks down about what the actual truth is about <laughs> yeah, yeah. population growth or living conditions or mm. how much better we are moving forward in time. and But the people's perception of throwing stuff out like, oh, this country's a wreck and mm. the world's living in poverty and how far behind there's like a, an echo of, of what was true in 1950 that's still believed today just because it was believed then and it takes such a long time for, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. the change of an acceptance of a change of thought and, and the reality of stuff to filter through into the, what people believe. So that is a fantastic book. Yeah, yeah. That is a really good one. I got a similar one. Um, humankind mm -hmm. uh, is a similarly changes your perspective in a very positive way just makes you realize that people aren't generally as awful as we tend to think they are yeah <laughs> but that that's one of those books that made me come away thinking oh i might have to look at my sort of philosophy a bit more or look at um maybe my cynicism and maybe not be quite as closed-minded yeah but, but it was good for that reason but the ones that i had mainly because I, I was thinking fiction for this yeah of course you were of course it was but DBC Pierre's Vernon Godlittle. 
would be up there for me. And I think because when I read that, I probably read that about, I don't know, like 20 years ago or something. Uh, but that felt like an invitation to write. Do you know what I mean? Just to write in any mm. voice. And as long as your story was populated with interesting people, you basically had a book that drove itself forwards and had a and had an interesting kind of style to it or interesting voice to it, one that was believable. Uh, I thought that was um, that was a bit of an eye opener. And the other one, Tom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the other one I would put on my little shelf is I think it'd be very hard not to put Andy Stanton's Mr. Gum books. Really? Because they were just such a joy to read with the kids, like their faces when. Um, when Andy breaks the rules of storytelling or just goes a bit off piste to say something really silly. Yeah, yeah. And I think the child in me, you know, and I think there's still quite a lot of child in me, I think that really appeals to whoever that child is. And, um, and that, for the same reason, probably, uh, and I've talked about him before, but uh, Kurt Vonnegut um, mm -hmm. and his books. Similarly, I think the kind of writing that I really love is the kind of writing that is really sort of flexible it flexes it feels like it's really freely written it feels like it's unconstrained uh yeah, by convention yeah. do you know what i mean like someone's yeah. come along and gone this is how you got to write a book these are the genres this is the style you got to keep them real and i love i love writers who you know who feel like they can just i suppose push the boundaries a little bit i suppose it's those ones isn't it that make you forget you're reading something while you're reading it you're just in it yeah, than... but in a way, I suppose, in a way, with those books, you're you're really in it, but at the same time, you sort of they're making you think about language. Do you know what I mean? So there is a little mm. bit of distance somehow. Mm. But stuff that plays with words, plays with literature, and your expectations, that always makes me very happy. So there you go. There's my answer to that. Brilliant. So back to the bookshop. Yes. Oh right, what are you going to ask him now about the load bearing capacity of a bookshelving unit? Uh, no, I didn't ask that, Tom. Right. Well, maybe you should. Maybe you should have done. <laughs> But I did ask about what kind of book sells really well in a little indie bookshop like The Grove so that we can take Mike's advice and create a formula for the perfect little bookshop book and thus become massive bestsellers. <laughs> All right, that is very cunning. Now you're talking. So if you had to describe the kind of book that does very well here, like, I don't know, I mean, I know that's an almost impossible question, but if you were to create the perfect Grove book. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So you're just going to sell tons of them. They're going to fly off the okay, shelves. Right. Well, what you, am I writing? You're talking fiction here. Yeah. Because it would help if you were a woman. Okay. Not Can deliberately. Work with that. It's just, you know, just the way it seems to work. Something with a really strong story. It's got to be really well written. We have a lot of customers who are quite choosy. <laughs> Some people demand it to be a certain length. So you have to oh, really? To, yeah, how much, but I'm not going to read that too many pages. Uh, or, oh, I see. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's yeah. usually about yeah, medium. Yeah, 250, 250, 300 pages okay. maximum, although we've, we've had some massive sellers that were much bigger than that. Hmm. Beyond that, I mean, they're, they're quite wide-ranging, really, but I mean, that's your typical book, I would guess. But um, maybe set in an interesting place where there's a, kind okay, of a yeah. political action. And, All right. And, yeah. Maybe a bit exotic. Yeah, possibly, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're thinking of things like Khalid Hosseini, you know. And, mm -hmm. But not necessarily. And then we sell an awful lot of crime as well. But the alternate thing would be you, you could write cosy crime. Yeah, yeah. In that, Yorkshire. that seems to be quite yeah, popular. Yeah, preferably yeah. with well, the cat or a dog in it. <laughs> <laughs> as a key character. Yes, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, that's very useful. Okay, I'll get I'll get started on that tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I've got one. What? I've got one. What? One what? What have you got? A brilliant idea. Yeah. For the perfect little indie bookstore novel. Have you? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Share, Tom. Come well, on. Come on. What What does it need to be? Uh, what have we it needs to be medium length. Yeah. Can uh, do. Can needs... do. I'm not in for writing anything long. <laughs> um, it needs to be written by a woman. Have you got have you got a pen name? You just need a we'll pen name. We'll just do a pen name, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh what else do we need? Uh oh, pet. Some sort of animal Some animal, animal animal involvement. And it needs to be kind of sort of cozy mm. cozy crime. And yet thing, exotic yeah. as well, ideally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What are you thinking? So <clears throat> here's my medium length uh novel. A retired blind vicar. Mm. 
quaint, yeah? Yeah, I like that. That's nice. He's moved to the south of France, John. Of course he has. That's a nice... You can see the scene already, I'm can't there. you? there, yeah, yeah. Yeah? He's a bit stuck in his ways, is he? Yeah, yeah. He's quite English. He is. So the French but, are a little um, bit... He's a mm. little bit quirky. He's little bit quirky. Guy. But yeah. he solves murders with his guide dog, John. Oh, that's nice. Yeah? I feel like this has been made as an ITV drama already. It hasn't yet, but it will. <laughs> it, it will have been when this has been written. It's really nice. Do you know what it's called? What? Collared. <laughs> because the Vic has got a collar, because the dog has got a collar. Oh, and what's happening Tom. to the criminals, John? Oh, they're getting they're collared. They're getting collared. Oh, Tom. It's it's a little bit beautiful, that. Isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? You can see the... Can you see the cover? Oh, my God, can I see the cover? It's yeah. got the embo- it's, The title's got the embossed writing, but it's got that kind of... Uh... It's just got two collars next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thing, it's all you need. Nice little French background. Yeah. A little bit of a watercolour oh, background in there. Yeah, it's yeah. really bright colours. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is a pick me up in the oh my God. airport bookshop. It absolutely is. Yeah. You see, we were talking about uh, high concepts last week. That is a that's a nail yeah. on. Yeah. That's really lovely, Tom. Well done. There we go. Mine's n- I see, I have learned is- something today. What's yours? <laughs> My, I don't think mine's as sellable as yours. Mine's, mine's gone a little bit more. I thought for a second you were going to say it. Mine is exactly the same. How freak is this? <laughs> really that would that... be mental, wouldn't it? <laughs> How weird is that? Um, it is a medium-length novel, obviously. Good, good. Um, it's by Catherine Karavuska. I um, thought that sounded a little bit mysterious and exotic, yeah, but also yeah. a bit literary, you know? Mine is a little bit, li- it's a bit less genre-led. It's a bit more literary. Yeah. Now, you, could, you could argue, Tom... That my novel is a little bit more serious than your novel. Mm? Okay. Yeah. A bit insulting because I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Imagine this, Tom. Prague, March 1939. Anna, who's recently returned from where she's been studying in England, inherits a badly run bookshop from her father, who has mm. just died mysteriously. You picturing that? Yep. The bookshop's been in decline for years, right? Because her father has seemingly become increasingly distracted by other things. But not only does she inherit his bookshop, but also also his pet pig, Kafka. <laughs> I didn't get pig. Mm. My brain was going. I was thinking mm-hmm. maybe it was a parrot. I could see a parrot in the bookshop. No, pet pig, Dog Kafka. Dog too obvious, but wow. Very intelligent, very loyal, pot-bellied chap. And she, so she's reorganising this ridiculously disorganised bookshop when she yeah. finds behind some boxes of books a small door hidden at the back of the shop. And it leads down to a cellar where she finds more books, but these books are kind of weird. They're like ancient books with strange symbols on them. And there's also another door in the cellar at the back of the cellar with similar symbols engraved upon it. And she tries the door, but it's locked. And that night, she tries to leave the store, but there's this huge snowstorm that prevents her leaving. And uh, so she ends up staying. Just to eat the pig. <laughs> no, to Tom. Right, I'm no, sorry. No, no. ahead. No, the pig lives. She, right. But she ends up staying in the shop and she hears... Does he get on all right with the chickens that are running the shop? <laughs> <laughs> she stays in the shop. She hears noises from the basement. And the mm. next day, she finds out that German troops are marching on the city. Oh. The snowstorm having nearly prevented the occupying forces. That's true, that. That did happen in March. But to no avail. And she's she sat there. She's reading Wuthering Heights by the window, tickling Kafka's ears when the first troops arrive, marching along the streets, muddying the pristine snow. You can imagine that, can't you? That's, I mean, this is like the film version. Yeah. When a soldier bangs on the door asking for food and money. And so she retreats with the book she's reading down to the cellar. And she, she sort of tries to shut the door and hide it a little bit. She, but she hears the door above kind of smash open. And in a panic, she tries the little door in the cellar again. She thinks, if I can get behind this door as well. But it's no longer locked. She walks in. And she trips. And she falls. <laughs> she falls. <laughs> and when she comes round, she's lying on a soft mound of heather. And she looks up. And there's these hills that stretch away from her, bees buzzing around. And some distance off, she can see a a swarthy-looking man and a well-dressed young woman in a bonnet, talking animatedly. And she walks over to them, and they introduce themselves as Cathy and Heathcliff. 
they're pigs as well, or they're people. <laughs> they're actual people, right. not pigs dressed in bonnets, no. Yeah. And she realises that the cellar door is a portal into whatever book you're carrying at the time. And so, right. Oh, right. Okay. with the help of her faithful pig, she begins to wonder how she can use this incredible turn of events to defeat the Nazis and maybe, at the same time, just maybe, help some of her favourite characters from their tragic endings. Wow. That was a long summary. <laughs> I wanted to really paint the picture. I thought no, it was it's quite a good a nice idea, idea, though. You could have cut straight to the idea. That's a good idea. That <laughs> what would happen if she picked up a copy of The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Whoa. Would she be like going through a double do- Would that yeah, just would she like get some awkward portal. loop of falling through a wardrobe and a door into a wardrobe into a door? Or oh, something? my God. It's just falling forever. Yeah. I don't know. I think she, I mean, I think you've got to probably, after that first time, be quite careful about which book you take in. You would, wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd be very careful. Yeah. Yeah, there's some pretty dark dystopian novels. I haven't quite figured out how she gets back yet, but obviously there'll be a way, something to do with the book. Shut the book, I guess. Just shut the book up. Wow. Yeah, so I, hey, two, wow. two uh, quite interesting stories there. Yeah. What are you gonna, what was, what's, the, what's the working title? I haven't got that far, Tom. Have you got anything? Um, I mean, you could just call it The Bookshop. That's not very interesting. The book. The Book Wormhole. The Book Wormhole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good. <laughs> so, listen, should we go back to the bookshop? I think we probably should. We've had enough fun, haven't we? Okay, back to the bookshop. <laughs> We've had enough fun. Let's go to a bookshop <laughs> instead. See, I knew you'd come around to my way of thinking. Are there any insights that you think writers might find interesting? <laughs> it, it, the, the fact that we could choose whatever we sell doesn't mean that we're going to stock everything that we see. So I think... We get a lot of people coming in having written books and assuming that because it's been printed and bound, it could just sit on the shelf with everything else. They should have a signing and some books in the window and everything. And we, we can't always do that. You know, we haven't mm. got room for everything. So we do have to be discriminating in what, what we stock. And it's very, mm. very hard to say no to people. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes it's just not the kind of thing that will sell. We've all been in the business quite a long time. You get a feel for what's going to sell, what's not going to sell. And uh, sometimes you get it wrong, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, you'll literally get an author walking through the door most, and, and having Most it. days we get an email or wow. a phone call or wow. a visit. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading a letter in The Guardian from uh, an independent author somewhere in Hertfordshire. Mm. And they wrote this. As an indie author who is also published by a a smaller UK press. I'm able to sell books successfully through Amazon. Last year, I sold hundreds, a very welcome source of income. Perhaps I've been unlucky, but my attempts to work with my local independent bookshop have come to nothing. Despite the obvious parallels between indie bookshops and indie authors, my experience is that such shops are much more interested in working with big publishers. It is ironic, they put. I mean, what's... Your reaction to that? I mean, you were talking just now about uh, about authors coming yeah, off the yeah. street. It must be very difficult to turn people it down. It is, like yeah. You now, that's interesting what he says there because from our point of view, two things that we do which kind of refute that to some extent. We're welcoming local authors who come in and we, if we can't stock the book regularly and give it a place on the shelf, we'll often arrange to do an event with them where they can do a launch, get their friends along, mm-hmm talk about their book in a bookshop uh, and have a sort of celebration of publication, if you like. And mm-hmm. we will keep some in stock, but this, the event is the thing where we kind of raise yeah. interest in it. And then obviously if it goes well, we can keep the book in as well. Uh, we do try to support local authors, particularly non-fiction, so local interest, local history, anything yeah, like yeah. that. Is You've easier got a decent to section. Yeah, there, yeah. You, but... With that kind of thing, we know that there'll be a market for it. With fiction and poetry... I mean, it's much more difficult because it's such a competitive area. And unless we're going to get a stack of them and put them face out on the shelf and pile them up on the table, then it's not going to get noticed. Yeah, yeah. And we can't afford to do that because the space is minimal, you know. Um, the other thing, for the last 12, 14 months, we've had a regular independent publisher of the month. So we've chosen a different publisher every month, different sizes, mainly quite small publishers, people like handheld editions, Fairlight Press. We've got Reaction at the moment, who do lots of non-fiction stuff. Uh, we've do- used Blue Moose, who are based in Hebden Bridge. Uh, there are people who discovered Benjamin Myers, published his first book, The Gallows Pole, mm. and then 
sold the rights of it to, to a yeah, mainstream yeah. publisher. Uh, and we've done that every month now. And, we, and we're sport for choice. There are so many small publishers. Mm. Uh, we, we, we'll ask them usually. Sometimes we've got in a position now where people are ringing up us and asking if they can be our next publisher of the month, which wow. is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Great. So, yeah, so I think supporting independent authors and independent publishers is something we do mm. quite a lot. It just might not feel like it if you walk in off the street, say, so, with your stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are ways of doing it. And I think getting to know your local bookshop helps. Because if someone yeah. comes in and you've never seen them before, and so I just wanted to support my local shop. And- yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, surely you could have a little tiny nook for local mm. writers. Do you know what I mean? Just like a little shelf. Maybe just allow them all, all your local writers, just one book. That's nice. Yeah. That's a nice idea. But though. then, Tom, yeah. I did what? the maths. Oh, right, okay. And I realised that if just one writer comes in every day, like Mike said, uh, with yes. just one book... Yeah, And let's face it, it's not going to just be one book, is it? After a year, you'd need another 10 metres of shelving, which is quite Ooh. a lot for a small bookshop. <laughs> it is. That's probably, yeah, some bookshops, that's literally half of their, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of get that. I, kinda, I do get the problem. But you can you can understand how writers are like, you're, but, but you're my local bookshop. If you if you don't take my books, then who who's yeah. going to take my books? Yeah. yeah. I like the um, realism of the local writers. And I think that would be us just taking one book in to sell. <laughs> Even if he agreed to stock it. Like, no, no, you probably just you probably do just need one. Yeah. And them still shaking their heads. Going, that's too many. We won't be able to shift I'm that a number. Mate. <laughs> oh, what oh. a cruel industry. Yeah. Uh, tell you what. Anyway, let's uh let's go back there and hear some more. It seems like a very complicated world now as well, publishing. Like you say, there's lots of like smaller publishers. There's, you know, people publishing completely independently. There are there are authors selling directly yeah. as well. How much of an inroad has that and digital only and, you know, Kindle books, how much has that made an impact? Have you sensed it or is it are you really talking to different people in this bookshop? Um, I think when I first started working here, this is about 12 years ago, there was a real fear that ebooks were, were going to be the future and sales of certain things like popular fiction, crime fiction, kind of things you only read once. Mm. Although <laughs> some people read crime books again and again. But that, it's the that, kind of thing you can read well, again yeah, and again, yeah. isn't it? You sort of forget who yeah. the killer is. <laughs> like three years later, yeah. just read the same book. Uh, that kind of thing, that would be the first thing to go, probably. Travel guides, things like that, because mm. people would just have them on the screen. And there was a bit of a blip for a while. And then I think everything found its level and people were using Kindles and devices, not just for books, but for other things as well, for games and whatever. So it just became like an entertainment system rather than just a a book Mm. replacement. And also people missed the physical aspect of books, the smell, the feel of them, Mm. the opportunity to browse in a shop. Mm. And the publishers reacted by improving the, the kind of standards of presentation of books. So the covers were more colourful, they were brighter, they were more mm. interesting, using different artists and designers. The classics is a really good example, which I often give. 15 years ago, you go, went to the classics section of a bookshop and it's just the black spines of Penguin Classics. And that was mm. it, really, with a few paler oxid ones in there. And now you look at it, it's one of the most colourful sections in the shop. They're mm. always trying new ways of livening up classics and having cloth-bound books, making it something you want to hold and keep. And yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it, a book as object as well as a book itself. Yeah, it's a bit similar to the return of vinyl, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the analogue yeah. Yeah, yeah, version yeah. in yeah. some ways. has It holds more value somehow. Than... Yeah. People, we've even got candles that smell of bookshops because so many people have come in and said, oh, I love the smell of this place. There is, there is a certain scent. I mean, I'm getting yeah, it now, yeah. even as, as I'm sitting I here. It it's, is, not, it's not just mildew, is, is it? I mean, it's very nice. I'm making it sound like that's quite an unpleasant thing, but yeah. it's a, no, it is. It's lovely. Yeah, it's I think a lovely, musty it's, it's smell, isn't it? It's the paper and the... It's probably the dust as well, but um, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what we should do on the back of that? We should... What, uh, Tom? What? We should create our own range of candles for writers. Huh? Yes, specific for writers, fragrances. We could, we could, we could start another podcast. Mm. Call it the Fragrant Writers Podcast. Oh, that's nice, couldn't we? Yeah, we should do that. Yeah. What candles? What what smells would you have if you? Oh, uh, a range of candles. 
I don't know. Um, li- library dust. You know, it smells of that kind of foisty. Yeah. Book. Um, on that, you could have you could have a candle that's just called shh. That's nice. <laughs> that what, library. Edit. Maybe it's yeah. like so powerful it makes you gag a bit, so you can't speak. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know what other flavors could we have. Well, you could have fa- you could have famous books. Do you know what I think? If oh, there was right, a range yeah. of famous books. They would really sell, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would actually. It's exactly the kind of thing that would sell. You could have uh, like Great Gatsby. What would that smell? That would smell of like champagne and gunpowder. Yeah, part. It just smelled like early twentieth century party. Yeah, really. yeah. Um, what else could you have? Uh, Animal Farm. Mm. <laughs> I'm not it's sure that's far the arts. It's not massive. It's probably not yeah. going to be a top seller. That maybe not. But it would. It would have like a hint of sort of Russian luxury layer cake or something. You know. Yeah. Hints yeah. of that going on. Yeah. Um, I was going to say you could have a range of tasteful erotic fiction candles, but Gwyneth Paltrow's kind of beating us to the charge on that. Yeah, one, that's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We try and joke about these things, and then someone does <laughs> yeah, that. Someone's already done. Mm. It. Yeah. yeah. You could have. Um, an almond scented one mm. it's called garolmond gar garolmond because that's the font that most books are written in i gar- see we go garolmond yeah. we're going typeface nice yeah what about um just calling it like creaky stairs and it would just smell of like a book you know because oh, yeah. good bookshops always have like some slightly too narrow creaky stairs yeah, creaky stairs or so i thought- kind of that woody kind of you know that sort of books and wood and yeah, stuff mixed or like stuff. evocative of story is what I thought you were going to say. You could have one called Dark and Stormy Night. Oh, right, you know, okay, yeah. You like could a, go down that route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say you could have one called Happy Ending, but that, that has <laughs> different, that's not, that would, yeah. Would, same, you know. same but different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about, what if you had one that um, just smelt like the book section of a large high street retailer? <laughs> Yeah, what would you call that? I'd call it W H Sniff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, maybe maybe we should those lost um, those lost places that you miss, um, like Woolworths, for example. I mean, that's um, oh, that you could say yeah, if you had old old you know yeah, C N A Woolworths Blockbuster. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, did they have distinctive smells? Maybe we should. Maybe we should move into like the sort of men's fragrance market. Yeah. Blockbuster for men. <laughs> you can see it, can't you? You can. And we, I tell you what, who do a good job of doing those little, do you remember the uh, Penn Halligan fragrance things that I read out to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. We'd be good at writing them, mate. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think it's probably time to go back to the bookshop. Yeah. Uh, I don't suppose you've ever thought about writing a book, <laughs> having, the, having the insight and the... Uh, uh, it, it's crossed my mind, but I, I, I wouldn't know where to start you know so i used to write, do little bits of writing when i was younger but um but i just thought i need to really make the time yeah, to yeah. do something about it they will say that if you say you haven't got time to write then you're not really a writer because if you, if you need the time you make the time and find oh, it. damn you see that that excludes <laughs> me from being a writer definitely <laughs> damn so tom yeah i feel like now might be a good time just to ask you mm-hmm. What have you been writing this week? Because I was thinking if we've both been writing, then we can ignore that comment about being a real writer because we must be real writers because we've been writing. You've been writing? Um, I have. I've been doing a little bit of writing, not as much as I wanted. It's been quite a frustrating week for that, actually. Ah, oh, that's annoying. Uh, but you have got some in. That's Well, that's good for oh, a frustrating yeah, yeah. week. Ticking, ticking along. I think the kids' book is up to about 22,000, 23,000. Brilliant. So it, it's, it's moving forward. I've got to that that's bit something. in it now. It's the bit that is normally one of the many bits that has normally stopped me in the past. Yeah. Of just thinking, oh, this is all a bit boring now. Where's it going? Like, what's. <laughs> and then thinking, oh, think that bit normal, of the start needs to change, doesn't it? This is the wrong. Yeah. Which obviously is what's meant to happen in the. That's the next yeah. bit. You just need to get through it. Yeah. To finish. Yeah. Because there'll be some other bits I'm going to write next week that will be kept. Yeah. But So you need to get to those and they can't exist until you've written the bits that won't be kept. <laughs> yeah. And doesn't every writer, you know, every writer says this, I mean, phrases it differently, but basically says the same thing. Like, is there's always a moment, isn't there? Yeah. Where you just want to stop. You just want to give up. Well, I think it's that thing, isn't it? The first draft is always shit. Well, yeah. It's, it's everyone's, you know. And, yeah. And I yeah. think I, I set kind of weird pointless high standard i think well no it shouldn't be it should be brilliant <laughs> yeah yeah i should be able to read this back and it's yeah and it's going to blow my mind <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, no, it's really true. But every, every single bestseller ever written, yeah. must, there must have been a really shit version of it to start with. Pretty much. So, yeah, keep going, Tom. Well, yeah. oh, that's brilliant that you, you know, you're chipping away. Really good. Hey, Katie and I had a brilliant idea when we were away on our anniversary. Oh, yeah. We're going to, instead of we normally just get a cup of tea and then have a cup of tea in bed for about 40 minutes, have a little chat, maybe do a wordle and... Um, Giving you a little window into fascinating into inside that, John. Wow, really is. <laughs> but we've decided that we're going to write the uh, the marriage show every morning. So we because the hardest bit of writing, I think, is getting back into the writing when you haven't done it for like a week or two weeks or whatever. Yes, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. Forget what the hell you've been. No, doing. No, you feel like you need to catch up with it again. If yeah, you, oh, exactly. That's taking up time, I can't bother to do that. Exactly. So yeah. we said we'll do a bit every day, and that's the only time in our day that we've pretty much got that you can ring fence, and you definitely both yeah. can be there. And yeah, yeah. And we've been doing it for like two weeks now. Oh, brilliant! And we've weirdly we've written quite a lot. <laughs> well, it's funny that, isn't it, when you <laughs> commit time and yeah. effort to it, somehow it does seem to make the words come out. Yeah. Well, so that's, that's really my good. little bit of news. That's great, though. Yeah, yeah, please. So wrong course, then. Wrong course. Well, it's a it's a better course. It's been a better course recently, and that's that's got to be good. Anyway, should we go back to that bookshop? So yeah, maybe maybe just finally, what does the what does the future of book selling look like to you? Whether that's just the Grove or whether you know more generally, where do you see the that's industry moving? Um, whew. I think we're always trying to, to freshen the place up and modernise a little bit, change the kind of books we have in to reflect the audience. A lot of that depends on who the customers are, I guess. Because Ilkley, maybe 20 years ago, a lot of our customers were the older generation. Mm. Yeah. So it, it just, just depends really on who, on how Ilkley develops as well. I and mean, we try to get get involved more in the community. We were have we had a bookstore at the Pride event at the, the King's Hall mm. last year. We just had a display, which someone manned for us this year, that we'll go there and be there in person. And it was really successful and kind of kicked Great. back into the shop as well because people were coming in. So everything we do is really try and get people to come to the shop, really focusing on the physical side. Anything we sell beyond that is a bonus, you know, so it's online sales, yeah. but also social media. We're working more on social media, doing more stuff with that to try and reach out. What platform? Just all... Uh, Instagram, Twitter... Yeah. Um, we, we do have Facebook, but we don't really do much yeah. of it. And who mans that? Because that's, a, that's uh, a, almost well, a full-time yeah. <laughs> job if you were to, you know. We take it in turns with, with Twitter. Instagram, we've got Emily, who works there. She um, has started taking over that and doing great things with it. You know, you can great. tell that more people are looking at it and being involved in it. So, yeah. And trying to do more events as well. We got a bit carried away recently. We ended up doing about six events in a fortnight. I think we need to pull back <laughs> a little bit and just do maybe yeah. a couple of months. It's just because it gets different people into the shop. People yeah, wouldn't yeah. normally come here. Um, and then they go out and tell their friends. And then they say, oh, I didn't know you did these events. And then if you do a range of different ones, then there should be something for everyone. We've had some some popular crime. We've had some local interest. We've had poetry. We've had um, There's a performance poetry event this, coming up this week. Uh, we had a novelist a few weeks ago. It's just anything we can find that, that will appeal to a range of people, I think. Mm. And we were talking before about um, having writers group in here as well. Yeah, yeah. How does that work? Is that is that just a once a week, once that, a month? That, that's what, once of... a month. We're, we're thinking about having other things. We've, we've always thought about a book group. Well, that's difficult mm. because book groups tend to be groups of friends and yeah, they yeah. like to do it in their own houses. And then also um, story time for children, yeah. which would have to be at certain times because the shop gets so busy it's really hard because being a small shop it's hard to do things when the shop's open so most Mm. events tend to be after hours yeah um with children's story time if you had it on a saturday morning no one would be able to get into the children's yeah yeah it's (laughs) it's hard but we want to do want to try it yeah try anything you know fantastic mike thank you very much for uh, spending a bit of time with me that's really brilliant thank you so there you go. Um, that was my little chat with Mike at the Grove. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, very cheers, lovely Mike. of you to take some time and chat with me. I uh, just want to give a little shout out, actually, to Emily, who was mentioned there, mm-hmm. who, and this is very weird, Tom, Emily is the very same Emily Devane yeah. who won the Bath Flash Fiction Award in 2017 with a very brilliant piece called The Hand That Wields the Priest. Right. And even more weirdly... When yeah. I was last in the bookshop, I spoke to Emily and she told me 
that she was also the judge of the Bath Flash Fiction Award when Kathy Hoyle, the judge of our Flash Fiction competition, won the same prize. Wow. How weird is that? It's quite a small world, it's isn't like it? A little, yeah, a little loop, isn't it? That? Yeah, very strange. Yeah. I was thinking if, wouldn't it be brilliant if Emily entered our competition and then ended up winning it with Kathy? See, that's typical you, John, showing lack of ambition there. Isn't it? That's not what should happen next in that loop. The next thing that happens in that loop is that mm. you win the Bath Flash Fiction Award, isn't it? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, keep, I'm not going to imagine that, am I? Keep the circles doing. That's what you do. <laughs> so that's what you need to do. Yeah, keep this, keep it spiraling outwards instead yeah, of folding absolutely. back inwards. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Maybe I have to enter it then to uh, actually have a, an opportunity <laughs> to yeah. win it. First steps. First steps. Well, okay, Tom, how was that? Was that wasn't too painful, was it? Was that too? We we learned a couple of useful facts, didn't we? Yeah, like we need to uh, change gender, um, at least in pen name. <laughs> That'd probably be the easiest way to do it, I would imagine. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Write a cozy mystery set somewhere exotic. Yeah. Well, I'm, not, I'm like the best-selling series Collard. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the bookshop and looked for a book. They said they'd a nice one. It looked very good. But when I got home and I had a good look It had too many pages and not enough hook Went back to the bookshop and said, wait a mo A man wrote this book and there's not enough flow There's no cockapoos or bergamascos They told me in no uncertain terms just to go Piss off and stop Wasting their time. I'm sure that's not the only thing we learned, Tom, but but yeah. Anyway, do you know what would be a nice way of wrapping up this episode? Uh, you repeatedly tell me how great I am. Um, pay all my bills for me or buy me a rabbit. You could buy me a rabbit, like a really <laughs> fluffy one. Like, you know, one of the big ones. Oh, yeah. And the, the uh, I'm going to him, I'm gonna call him Jessup. Nice. nice no, I, that's not what I was thinking, Tom. I was thinking no. a really nice way to wrap up this episode yeah. would be to visit a few of the most famous bookshops around the world the bucket list of bookshops but obviously we can't do that right now listeners so join us next week when we've had a chance to go around the world so you have you booked us tickets and stuff for this are we gonna mm, not exactly i thought yeah i thought yeah we could travel using the medium of sound design <laughs> Ah, right, okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, it's not yeah, not quite as exciting, but I guess that means we can mm -hmm. we can do it now in this episode. That yeah, that's what I was thinking, yeah. More sense. But um but no, fair enough. I have to admit this episode hasn't been the complete waste of time I thought it was certain to be. So uh, <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, that, that's that means go a lot. on. Go on then, fine. Right, right, I'll be enthusiastic about it all. Ah, uh, brilliant. Okay. okay. Where are we going first, John? That's the spirit. We're yeah. going to Argentina. Whoa, this, look at this, this is cool, John. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, it's, it's not a blooming library, is it? It's just a bookshop. Still, it's all books and stuff, isn't it? Oh, so a bit of respect. Oh, yeah. Sorry, books. But you're right, Tom, it is cool. This is yeah. the Ateneo Grand Splendide, tucked away in the trendy Recoleta neighbourhood of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Bloody no, we're on a bike. Look at that ceiling, John. That's my uncle. There aren't many bookshops with frescoes on the ceiling, are they? Look, look at that. It looks like um, mm. like a, not a cathedral, but like a, an old theatre or something. Something like that. Well, funny you should say that, Thomas, because mm. it is. It's oh. an old opera house, in fact. It was opened originally in 1919 when Buenos Aires was booming. In fact, back then it was one of the wealthiest cities in the world, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah. And then the building was converted to a bookshop in the early 2000s. Tom? Tom? What? Where, where are you going? I've just noticed the stage area. It's uh, they've done it into a cafe now, so probably time to get one of them Argentinian hot chocolate submarino jobbies. All right. Well, hang on. Apparently, apparently in Argentina, there's only a tiny proportion of books bought online, uh -huh. right? right? Which means that Buenos Aires actually has over 700 bookshops. They mm, bloody right. love books here. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's uh, that's fascinating. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
And people like to go out and, you know, actually see them with their actual eyes and pick them up with their actual hands. Do you know and what I mean? Well, yeah, you can see you can see why they might want to do that, really. Uh, dos submarinos, por favor. Bueno. Hey, look, there's uh, people sat up in the, in the old posh boxes, like the Royal Box oh, thing. Oh, yeah. Nice place to sit and peruse a book. Yeah. You could imagine spending a whole day in here. It's often cited, this place, as the world's most beautiful bookstore. It might well be, John. It might well mm. be. I'll give you this one. This, this, is, this is a good one, though. But there's only one small problem we seem to have found there. What? What's that? All the books are in, uh, they're in Spanish, so I can't really, can't really read them. A bit pointless. Oh, yeah. Ahí tienes. Muchas gracias. Cheers, Tommy. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, right, uh, my turn then. Um, okay. Tell you where we'll go. Right, mm-hmm. next on the list, John. Mm-hmm. Gay party! <laughs> oh, come on. Look at that. Spilt hot chocolate all down my t shirt. Hey, I think I know this one. <sighs> yeah, no, it's a famous one, this one, right? Yeah, I visited it on my holiday. Oh, right, so you've, oh, you've been in already. Well, I, I actually didn't get inside. I didn't, I didn't realise it was a public holiday. I came all the way here to look round and the place was shut. Oh, right, well. Yeah. Come now, my friend, explore Shakespeare and Company. Well, thank you very much. Hmm. Isn't it nice? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you did try and visit, so you might be familiar with the history of Shakespeare and Co, John. Well, yes, sort of, but I have sort of forgotten quite a lot about it. I know that yeah. this isn't the original... Shakespeare and Company bookshop, though. No, that's that's right, completely right. It was named after the original shop, which was opened by Sylvia Beach, who famously took a chance on publishing James Joyce's Ulysses. I don't know if you've ever heard oh, of that that book, yes. John. Quite famous in its time, that's that. I Sylvia believe. Beach, yes. Um, and also encouraged and promoted Hemingway's first book. Again, oh. I don't know if you've heard of Ernest Hemingway. Um, but yeah, she <laughs> began the whole philosophy behind Shakespeare and Co. that I guess continues today, really. A bookshop and lending library that supports writers. So, you know, and obviously nice. because of that kind of vibe, it, it, it drew famous writers from around the world, really. So, what happened to it, the original uh, one? Well, the old, uh, the old World War Two got in the way. Um, uh, so when Paris was occupied, yeah, it kind of... Uh, they had to shut. Yeah. Damn. So, so this shop is kind of a reincarnation of the spirit of the original. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the original one was just around the corner, really, about sort of a kilometre away, so... It's very cosy, isn't it? Just, uh, just stand there, Tom, uh-huh. in front of the piano, All and right, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take a photo of you. Okay. No, no, no. Pas de photos, s'il vous plaît. Sorry. Uh, he said no, no photos. So. Oh, uh, je suis désolé. Yeah. Uh, oops. Very secretive here, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's. I think they don't like it because tourists just come in, take loads of photos, and then bugger off again. You know the sort. Oh, well, like us. Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Pretty a much. fair point. So, so when did this Shakespeare and Company open? Ah, so this one was opened by an American ex-serviceman called George Whitman. He opened another English-language bookshop here, just across the river from Notre Dame, called Le Mistral in uh, 1951, I think. And so a bit like uh, Sylvia's place became sort of like a, a hub for writers. So uh, Ginsberg, Burroughs, Bertolt Brecht, James Baldwin. Ooh, um, big names. Yeah, apparently Sylvia Beach, being a friend of George Whitman's, handed the name over of Shakespeare and Co. to him not long before she died in 1964. Um, Very generous. So when she did, he changed the name to Shakespeare and Company in homage to her original shop on the anniversary of Shakespeare's birthday, which uh, ah, is a nice little touch. Lovely story. Yeah. So, um, sorry, it might sound like a, a bit of a weird question, but I couldn't help noticing, uh, Tom, what, what's with the beds? Oh, yeah, the beds, the beds. beds in well, the little nooks. One of the tenets of the original Shakespeare and Company was that it mm. wanted to support writers, like mm. we said, but especially like the proper struggling kind. Like know? us again. Yeah. No, but like the proper struggling, destitute yeah. oh, those, artist yeah. writers yeah. with talent and an urge to write. Oh, so, right, not like us. <laughs> in like many us, ways, then. not like us, no. Um, but like a lot of writers, I guess, do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, the, 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 there's not an easy living to be made for me. Mm. Um, but if you're a writer and you find yourself in Paris with nowhere to stay, Shakespeare and Company will let you stay here in exchange for, like, you know, helping out around the place. So, oh, nice. Right. Yeah. yeah, got you. Proper bohemian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and the people that stay, they're known as tumbleweeds. 
Oh, so. that's nice. Yeah. That explains that sign there. Ah, be yeah. not inhospitable to strangers, lest they be angels in disguise. You never know, do you? you never no. Know. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, Ooh, actually, I'm a bit tired after all the whipping around travel. It does uh, kind of take out, isn't it? So I don't know if, do you think we'll be all right if we have a quick uh, <sighs> kip? We don't have time for that, Tommy. Why? What are we, what are we doing now? We're, We're off, off to, to Portugal! Oh, yeah, you see, look at this. This is like a bookshop from a film or something, isn't it? Mm. All carved wood and panelling and stained glass. I like this. This is, I like it a lot. Yeah, this is good. Well, this, this is good. Thomas, this is one of the top ten oldest bookshops in the world. Mm. Livraria Le Lou in Porto. Wow. Uh, so all these books are like hundreds of years. That's amazing. So this, so is this like an ancient copy of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban? That's, wow. Mm, no, so no, everything's, Tom. No, it, I'm not. Look at this, what I'm old. Look at this, John. What? Is that? It's probably a thousand year old first edition of Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, probably, yeah. All the old books, wow. Pretty yeah. cool, eh? Glad you yeah. came. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And do you know what? Speaking of the wizarding world, mm. Tom, these amazing steps here up to oh, the yeah. gallery are apparently the actual inspiration behind the moving staircases at Hogwarts. Oh my God, the stairs move as well. That's amazing. Well, no, I'm not. That, what are you saying about bookshops being magic? You're right, aren't you? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This, yep. Fair enough. Brilliant bookshop. Well done. Yeah. And because we've magicked in here using mm -hmm. magic, we actually don't have to pay to look around because we've kind of snuck in. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what? what do you mean pay to get to look in a who pays yeah. to be in the bookshop? Well, it's, it, it's understandably quite a popular bookshop. And uh, much like Shaky and Co, people were starting to come in and just kind of look around and take photos and God, not buy books. What kind of people books. do that? <laughs> they do, apparently. Unbelievable. Yeah. The so, cheek so they, on some people. <laughs> seriously. So they decided to uh, charge a small fee to come in. Right. But you can redeem the fee by buying a book. So, oh, uh, well, that would be just a, just a cost for me. I wouldn't be buying any books. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, should we just uh, get off before they realise we haven't actually paid then? Because uh, mm. that bloke over there is looking that is a bit funny. It's oh, yeah, he is actually. Coming over. Oh, God. We, uh, uh, yeah, time to make like Harry Potter. Well, yes, and I know exactly where to apparate next. You ready? Let's go. Oh, look at this. This is very quaint. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is what's, nice. What's, what's happened to your voice, mate? Hey? Your voice? I don't know. That's weird, isn't it? I think that last teleportation seems to have blocked all my sinuses. All right, yeah, no, that can happen. That can happen, that. Um, all right. The only major downside of teleportation, really. That, um, oh. that and occasionally turning inside out, apparently. So, Ooh. could be worse. Uh, anyway, it's nice, isn't it? Look at this. It's really Open nice. fireplaces, comfy seats. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's all very Victorian, isn't it? In a good way. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so where are we, Tom? Right, well, this is Barter Books in Annick in the northeast of England. Oh. And we're in what was the old railway station, so it is Victorian. Um, well, you know, a decent part of it, not Very the bit with the cool. trains on and stuff. Ah, that would explain the, uh, the, the model railway running around the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, and uh, a little bit different to the other bookshops we've visited. Oh, yeah? It's all second-hand books in here. So right. it's actually one of the largest second-hand bookshops in the country. Blimey, I can see why they've got some of these behind glass. Yeah. Look at that. Edgar Allan Poe, first edition, 1846. Seven and a half grand. Tom. I know, they've got, they've got crazy first editions like that, as well as like thousands of normal second-hand books too. All right. So is the idea that if you've got some decent books that you want to get rid of, you can bring them in and they'll offer you barter credit so that you can spend it on books? Yeah, yeah that exactly book? that. But, but... Mm. They do have a bit of a list on their website about the stuff they really don't need or want. Um, ah, right, yeah. I yeah, think yeah. they must have had a lot of people trying to give them a lot of common books that you just... Right, fob them off. ...can't do anything with, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you only need so many copies of Dan Brown, don't you? Yeah, yeah, is, is that number less than one, maybe? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I like it, Tom, I like it a lot. I bet you're surprised about that, aren't you? It's just <laughs> got, a proper, it's got yeah. a proper feeling to it, hasn't it? It's got the feels, this place. Yeah, it's just a lovely spot to hang out. I mean, they've yeah. got all the little different rooms, the cafe, the open fires. It's, it's a bit of an oasis, isn't it, from the outside world? I'm, I'm sensing some enthusiasm from you, Tom. Uh, um, I mean, in a way, all the bookshops have been a bit like that, haven't they? Yeah, you know no, I mean? they have. They have, they have, yeah. So, 
does that mean that I've managed to change your mind on the whole bookshop thing? Are you well, starting to appreciate the magic now, Tom? Yeah, fine, I get it. Books are mystical, fancy smancy things, and the bookshops are like their understated temples, celebrating their very existence and giving nerdy bookworms, John, somewhere to worship. Come on! You see, that's it, yeah. Tom. That is it. And you know what? We should point out, we obviously, we haven't got time to do an exhaustive list of bucket list bookshops, but oh, yeah. you know, there, are, there are a lot more. I've heard there are quite a lot of other bookshops in the world, John. You are right. <laughs> but, you know, people get upset about these things, Tom. Yeah, you yeah. Don't, people get you don't name their names. specific yeah, favourite yeah, bookshop. Yeah. But if you do have a favourite, do you know what would be lovely? If you folks, if our listeners send us the name, maybe a photo of your favourite bookshop to our socials, Twitter, Instagram, threads, whatever, at Failing Writers. Don't forget to tag the bookshop in too, and we could try and get a little bit of a, a sort of an online loving for bookshops going. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, I mean. nice. that's a good plan, that, because uh, be nice, with the big online booksellers being around, it's more important than ever, really, that we don't go neglecting our, our local bookshops. Quite right, Tommy, 100%. Well, you know me, John, I'm a massive bookshop fan. So <laughs> Now? Yeah. yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Right, well, uh, it's probably it then, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to go home. Okay. Well, uh, how, how are we getting back? Well, I, I live just down the road, so I'll probably just get a bus, to be honest. That's why I thought I'd bring oh. us here to buy our books last. Near All home. right. Um, how, how am I going to get back? Well, can't you just use the travelly swooshy thing? It only works with bookshops. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, well, just go back go back to your local one then, where we were talking to Mike. What, the Grove? Yeah. I, sp- I mean, I suppose I could. It'd be a bit awkward, though, just nah. turning up back there. It'd be fine. Nah, come on. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed mm. the episode more than I have. <laughs> I did enjoy it in the end, John. I'm pulling your leg. <laughs> pulling your leg. Good. See you next time on the Failing Writers Podcast. And don't forget, next episode is a big one. It's when we find out who won our £500 flash fiction competition in association with Scrivener. Yeah, yeah, don't miss that. It could be you. It could. And then if you don't listen to it, you'll never know that you won our competition, which would be really sad. That would be so sad. It, it would really be. would be. Although, to be fair, we'd, we'd no doubt email you the following week. And we'll probably. Probably, probably. probably. That's not an excuse it. not to listen, though, is it? Exactly, Tom. Exactly, Tom. We need those download numbers. Absolutely. Yeah, listening. Listen to it twice, you buggers. Yeah. Anyway, we should head off. Thanks again, everybody. See you soon. Yeah, for some podcast or something. Bit of a strange lad, but harmless enough. Uh, What the hell? Sorry. Hi. Uh, I'm just... How did you get in? Mm, Yeah, it's a bit difficult to explain. Um, well, did, did he want something? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm, uh, I'm just gonna leave. Probably best. Yeah. Right. Bye then. Goodbye. Bye. Hello. Hello. Where's everybody gone? <laughs>